Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was praying. He was praying and having witnessed Jesus praying, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. The story of Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. And that the Gospels are telling us that Jesus was praying. It tells us there's something important about praying. There's something important about this practice and this discipline. Jesus models for us, his followers, a way to communicate with God, but not only relationship stronger. And as it turns out, this prayer also teaches us how to grow and develop our relationships with each other. Martin Luther had a little bit to say about the Lord's Prayer. We find that in the small catechism. We use it as part of our curriculum for faith formation. The point is that Jesus is showing his disciples and us a way to be in a relationship with God and with each other. And in that process, we see and learn how good and gracious God is. A comic strip cartoon of Dennis the Menace. And let me just give some of you a background if you don't remember Dennis the Menace or you never heard of Dennis the Menace. But Dennis was that neighborhood kid that was always in trouble. And he especially antagonized his neighbor, Mr. Wilson. He didn't try to be an antagonizing troublemaker. It's just that all of his ideas turned into something menacing that disrupted Mr. Wilson's life and usually left a great big mess. Mrs. Wilson, on the other hand, was always generous. And she was always gracious toward Dennis. So in this particular cartoon that I'm remembering, Dennis and his little friend Joey are leaving Mrs. Wilson's house. Their hands are full of cookies, and Joey says, I wonder what we did to deserve all these cookies. But Dennis replies, looking Joey in the face, look, Joey, he says, Mrs. Wilson gives us cookies not because we're nice, but because she's nice. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we realize that we are walking away with a handful of cookies. Our lives are touched by the loving hands of Christ, not because we deserve it, not because we've done anything to be worthy of it, but because of who God is and what God does. God loves us and provides for us, and it's grace upon grace upon grace. This morning, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about parts of the Lord's Prayer. As I, as I study the Lord's Prayer, I know that I could go on and on and on, but I don't know about you. I want to get lunch and then come back for the installation. <laughs> so we're just going to talk a little bit about parts of the Lord's Prayer, just a little bit of it. And so with the Lord's Prayer, it begins those first words, Our Father. Even that first word, our, teaches us something. The first word, our, is the possessive form of the pronoun we. And so what we realize immediately already is we are not alone. We are in community. We have something in common with others. There's more than one of us. We begin by calling on our Father. We don't say, my Father, who art in heaven. We begin with our Father, so that right away we realize we are not alone. We have a family. We live in a family. There are other children in the family. It's not just me, and for some of you, I hate to break it to you, it's not just you either. It's we, our, our Father. Not just me, myself, and I, not just you. We have brothers and sisters. We're part of a family. We're part of a beloved community. Our, our Father, the prayer begins. Father, Jesus invites us to address God as Father. 
We might remember the stories of when Jesus was baptized and later when he was transfigured on the mountaintop. There was a voice from heaven in those moments that said, this is my son, the beloved, or you are my son, the beloved. It reveals a loving, intimate relationship. And so Jesus, teaching his followers how to pray by inviting us to call upon God the way Jesus himself calls upon God, invites us in to that intimate, loving relationship that's ultimately characterized, yes, by love and grace and mercy and forgiveness, our Father. The first petition, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name. Well, how important is a name? It's pretty important, isn't it? A name can have priceless value. We also know that a person by their words or actions can ruin their reputation or ruin their good name. And then they're saddled with that bad name for their life. Names like Abraham Lincoln or Adolf Hitler bring to mind opposite reactions because of what Abraham did and because of what Adolf did and said. And as parents, we're always trying to impress upon our children the value of having a good reputation that reflects on their name, that reflects on our name. So think about it. If we care about our name, if we care about our children's and our, our own reputations and our names, if we care about those things, how much more ought we care about God's name, right? The name of God is priceless and valued beyond compare. Jesus cares that we protect it. And if we allow ourselves to sit in the presence of God and to love our Father with our whole mind and heart and being, then doesn't it follow that we'll make efforts to also protect the name of God and thereby keep it holy? Now, maybe that sounds a little like the second commandment. The second commandment says, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. So the commandment is telling us what not to do. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Whereas then the petition in the Lord's prayer is telling us what is indeed holy in itself. But we're praying this petition, we're praying this prayer that it may be holy among us and that we will be moved to keep it holy. The second and third petitions of the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done, or thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Again, Luther wrote in the small catechism, in fact, God's kingdom comes without our prayer. But we're asking in this prayer that it may come to us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And also concerning God's will, Luther wrote, in fact, God's good and gracious will comes about without our prayer. But we're asking in the prayer that it may also come about in and among us, that God's will will be done in us and by what we do. So when we pray these petitions, we're recognizing God's kingdom and will, and we're asking that we will be citizens of his kingdom and doers of his will. And what you might get there in, in this prayer then is we are being moved to do things. We are being moved to perhaps change. We are being moved to, to make God's will a part of our lives. When we speak of the kingdom, the word kingdom, what probably comes to mind is a country or a region that has political boundaries, a place that takes up some space, right? But in the New Testament languages, it's about the reigning activity of God. In other words, the way God rules, the way God does things. And we, as, as Jesus' followers, see 
most clearly and ultimately that the way God does things is to save people from sin and death and to give us abundant life. The kingdom of God isn't something we build or make happen. It's all God's doing, all God's activity. And it comes to us from God in the person of Jesus. The kingdom comes in the person of Jesus. And then praying this prayer, praying these petitions, assumes then a commitment on our part. We're asking God to do God's part. We're trusting God to do God's part. We're believing that God will do God's part. But we are also telling God that we intend to do our part too. We don't just pray and do nothing or keep doing things the same old way. It implies that we are committing ourselves, committing our lives to God, committing our lives to God's ways. We are making Jesus the Lord of our life. In this sense, prayer is not passive at all, but is hard work as we strive to seek the kingdom and to have the kingdom be lived out in our lives. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven, are no small prayers. They aren't prayers for staying the way we are. They mean we're ready to change. We're ready to live the way of God's kingdom. They point to our trust, our faith in God. And they speak of letting go of my kingdom, letting go of my will, and letting God's kingdom and God's will reign in our lives. In this way, these petitions point to the very mystery of God and life as they remind us that it really does matter how we live each day. It really matters how we care for the earth, how we talk with one another, and how we think about and treat others. I remember a youth mission trip that I led about 10 years ago to a small community in southern Illinois. We were working with a, a youth mission ministry group that served as coordinators, and they lined up the possible ministry opportunities in the community that we were going to go work in. And so what happens throughout a summer is that 65 high school students and adult leaders come from various churches for a week at a time into a community ready to serve. That particular week, we would split our time between running an afternoon kids club, like a vacation Bible school or a day camp, or going to work sites to do light home repair and painting. When we arrived Sunday evening after dinner, we spent time getting to know our fellow servants, and then we had evening worship, and then we slept on the Sunday school floors that I always take my air mattress when I'm going to do that. Well, Monday morning comes, and after breakfast, we spend more time in morning devotions and personal self-reflection. What I learned on these mission trips is that, yes, we're going to go do work, but we do as much spiritual work as we do physical work, spending time in worship and also spending time before we go out to do anything in self-reflection and devotions. And our theme that week, our theme was more or less, more or less, more Jesus, less me. More Jesus, less me. My group and a couple of the kids from our church, we were going to be planning kids club for a couple days. And so we were doing that. And what we did then, after we planned it, the adult leaders who were doing kids club, we get in our vans and we go around town and we pick up the kids. And they get in our vans and we bring them back to the church. So I'm out with two of our youth members and we're going to pick up kids. And we stop at the first house. The first kid to get in is 10-year-old Tyrone. And he gets in the van and gets buckled up. I introduce myself and our two youth members. And the next words out of his mouth are, so what's your life about? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? I looked in my rear view mirror to see from where those words had come. 
because I could have sworn that was Jesus in my back seat. So what's your life about? I was so taken by that question. I mentioned we spent the evening before in worship talking about the theme, more Jesus and less me. And then we spent morning devotions and, and quiet time reflecting on some directed questions. What does it look like in our lives? What does it look like in my life that there be more Jesus and less me? More of Jesus' ways and more of what Jesus wants and less of what what I want in my ways. What does that look like? So I've been, I've been in deep thought the evening before and the morning and the voice coming from my back seat, so what is your life about? And I had to stop. I'm glad I wasn't moving or I would have stopped <laughs> because inside me I'm hearing, yeah, June, what is your life about? What is your life about? Is it all about you? Or is it about Jesus? How about you? What is your life about? Is it all about you or is it about Jesus? Is your life all about you and what you want and, and what you want to do and what you want to have? Or is it about what Jesus wants? And through you so that others can see? What is your life about? As we hear Jesus teach his disciples to pray in today's gospel, we're invited into a relationship that leads to a transformational experience, an opportunity to have the Lord's ways be at work in our lives and through our lives to reach other people. We pray, hallowed be thy name, God. Your kingdom come, God. Your will be done, God. We pray for God's name to be holy, not my name or your name to be holy. We pray for God's kingdom to come, not my kingdom or your kingdom to come. We pray for God's will to be done, not my will, not your will, but God's will. I invite you to hear the voice of Jesus ask you today. So. What is your life about? And let's pray it's less about us and more about Jesus. Amen.